Okay, uh, in this situation, uh, the C1 by itself is uh, called the initial, and everything else is called the final. So uh, some of what Laurent was telling you about this morning included this uh, glide uh, or whatever, but it really doesn't make a, a great deal of difference for, for our purposes. Uh, personally, I think it makes better theoretic sense to split the syllable between onset and rhyme, but uh, as I say, it, it, it doesn't uh, uh, change anything as far as I know. So um, uh, this is sort of a survey of the rest of the syllable to, uh, as an overview. In this uh, final, which is the RVC2, we assume that the medial R can be either 0 or R. And uh, note, remember, or learn if you haven't, if you don't remember, that uh, Old Chinese has no uh, J before the uh, uh, main vowel. It has no glide W. What it does have is labialized initials, but it, so the labialization o occurs only with uh, velar and uvular initials, so you don't have things like TW. So that's a crucial part of the analysis of the vowel system. The main vowel can be one of six vowels, which is, there's the list. Uh, the coda, uh, it's convenient to uh, divide the possible codas into four classes. Uh, I call them T, K, W, and P. Uh, T are all of the uh, uh, coronals, basically, or uh, things like that, uh, Y, T, N, and R. Uh, K, uh, for our purposes, we can include zero as a K, although it often behaves a little differently. Uh, and that's a K and, and, and ing. Uh, w is a little peculiar. We only have W and this WK, whose status is uh, uh, still not quite clear, but we, we have to uh, assume it at this point. And then the P codas are the labial codas. Uh, after, in addition to that, uh, here are some of the other things outside that, those units that affect the development of the finals. Uh, the onset can be type A, which uh, we think may be pharyngealized, as, you've, uh, as we've told you, or type B. Uh, it also makes a difference whether the initial is uh, grave or acute, that is to say uh, uh, non-coronal or coronal, because the, the, finals, uh, the vowels develop, uh, often develop differently depending on what kind of initial consonant you have. Uh, in addition to what I've already told you, there can be this uh, post-coda uh, glottal stop after non-obstruent codas, uh, and that's what gives us the Middle Chinese shangsheng, unless it's followed by s, and s uh, trumps that, and if there's an s after that, an s can be added to any kind of syllable, uh, then that gives you the Middle Chinese chusheng, and this is basically the proposal of uh, Audricourt uh, from 1954. Uh, I'd also like to point out, I, I'm, I don't know how many times this recurs in the presentation today, but uh, this, uh, the S suffix leads to final uh, consonant clusters which get simplified. And this is, uh, uh, for KS, for example, I think we think just goes to S, the K disappears. WKS goes to WS, so, uh, and TS goes to JS. PS goes to TS and then JS. So uh, I, was, I was giving you an example yesterday afternoon of this uh, jie to make a connection and G. This was a case where we had PS uh, and we talked about the fact that this PS had already changed to TS in at least parts of the shijing. Uh, and then it went on to this. So, uh, and as I say, you can date certain sound changes uh, probably, and theoretically, from the time when you first begin to see uh, things which originally had a P coda written with phonetics that indicate a T coda, because that means that PS to TS has already occurred, uh, or they wouldn't pick a, uh, uh, that uh, phonetic element. And stop me if you, uh, I mean, I, I had the feeling last time I went so fast, sort of like a used car salesman and uh, didn't really slow down uh, <laughs> for, uh, for questions. Any questions about this part so far? Or comments or objections, anything? <laughs> okay, it's nothing much new. So uh, if you figure out the possible rhymes, uh, just the combinations of vowel plus coda, 
Not all of the uh, ones that you can imagine occur, uh, but here are the K codas, T codas, W codas, P codas, here are the six vowels. Uh, so here are the gaps. Um, we reconstruct IJ, but not a plain I. Uh, and that's a little asymmetrical because we reconstruct, uh, you would think then that we would reconstruct UW, but not U, uh, but that's not what we do. Well, um, there, it, I don't know that there's any great significance to this or if there was ever an opposition between I and IJ. It is possible that the J had, uh, some, in some cases, represents an earlier uh, coda, for example, an R that has disappeared, so we might somehow eventually find reason to, uh, to make a distinction here. Uh, but that, uh, at the moment, that's just the way it is and it doesn't do us any great harm. Um, and then the, uh, there are certain combinations that do not occur with W codas. The schwa, the U, and the O do not occur there. Only I, E, and A. And then, uh, well, <coughs> we think that all of, the co all of the vowels occurred with the labial codas, at, uh, originally at least. But this is one of the areas first where it's very difficult to uh, decide what the vowel is because uh, for several reasons. There was widespread uh, assimilation uh, that is, uh, rounded and unrounded uh, contrasts were lost before, uh, before labial codas. Uh, it may, the result may have been an unrounded vowel in some dialects and a rounded vowel in other dialects. Uh, we just don't know. Uh, and it is pretty clear, and one of the things that we would hope to work out eventually, if we can, it's pretty clear that different dialects had different uh, uh, treatments of these uh, uh, labial coda forms. Uh, for example, you f there's a word, well, there's a word for a hole, right, which is, uh, we have uh, Khan, which is K-H-O-M-X, and we have uh, Kung, which is K-H-U-W-N-G, and we have Quan, which also can mean a hole, which is K-H-W-A-N. So it looks like, uh, I suspect that the original form had a, had a, a labial uh, coda, it was K-H-O-M, but some dialects changed it to O-ing, and some dialects changed it to O-n, because we have these triplets, uh, sometimes doublets, sometimes triplets, with more or less the same meaning. Uh, in the classical language, they're all there, and their meanings are not necessarily identical, but... Uh, so the, problem, the labials give us a lot of uh, problems. Um, in, my, in my book, I argued that there were some cases in the Shi Jing where you could distinguish rounded and unrounded vowels. In particular, uh, I still think this is true. There's a, there was a dialect where M went to a velar nasal, evidently, because we find things like schwa M ry rhyming with schwa ing, and we also find uh, U M rhyming with U plus velar nasal. And in fact, there's one poem in which both things occur. So schwa, there's one stanza in which a schwa m rhymes with a schwa ing. And then the very next stanza, the word, uh, uh, there's a um word. Or I think it's a um word. Anyway, there's an m final word which rhymes in that stanza with u ing. And if I remember correctly, the, uh, the um word means is a form of the numeral three, which uh, um, is certainly tempting to connect with uh, uh, Tibetan, uh, Tibeto-Burman words for three, like uh, sum and so forth in, in Tibetan. So I think at least in the dialect in which that uh, was composed, you can tell that the schwa m and u m had different reflexes in that dialect, probably because uh, the m simply changed to uh, velar, uh, before the, it, whatever assimilations there were, dissimilations took place. Um, there is some textual evidence that this kind of thing uh, is a Western feature uh, in, from the Sichuan area. I, I haven't tracked this down recently, so I don't, I don't remember the details. 
and uh, presumably it would also it should also show up in poetry uh, of people from that region, which is another thing that shouldn't be hard to check, but I haven't gotten around to it lately. I haven't really dealt with this problem yet. But this is another case where we think we should be able, or we hope we will be able to establish dialect differences with geographical uh, connections. That is, we can say not just there were these three dialects, but we can say where each one was. Okay. So I want to run through the argument for the six vowel system. If you remember, Carlgren had, I don't even, I've lost, never can remember if it's 14 or 16 or however many vowels uh, in archaic Chinese. And part of the problem there was that he didn't uh, remove the, he didn't take uh, complementary distribution into account. He didn't believe in phono phonology. Um, and then uh, Li Fang Gui got it down to seven vocal nuclei. Uh, and I'll show you how that works in a moment in more detail. Um, but this is the process basically which I went through. This is the thinking process that I went through at the time that I decided that I could, could make it work with six vowels. Now, Nick Bodman was already working with a six vowel system, but I don't think he had worked out, uh, I'm pretty sure he had not worked out exactly how it was supposed to work. But so this is what it, what it, uh, uh, how it works. Um, in Middle Chinese, uh, you can see that, well, there are, if you like, plain syllables and fancy syllables. Okay, there are the uh, syllables in division one and four uh, occur with a limited set of initial consonants, and it's the same set in, in, one, in division one, that is with a back vowel in division four, which is with e. Uh, there's no retroflexion, no palatalization, uh, anything like that. So, so it looks as if one and four, uh, apart from the AB distinction, one and four uh, syllables of those two uh, categories uh, probably preserve uh, the vowels without any additives that complicate the picture. So, it's, so basically the, where I started was to figure out how many vowels you would need to account for the contrasts of middle Chinese in first and fourth division syllables. So for purposes of illustration, I'm going to take this uh, context, a, a sibilant initial f with an N coda and see how many contrasts we have in middle Chinese. Uh, and that will begin take us on the road to figuring out how many vowels we need for old Chinese. All right, well, there are four contrasts in middle Chinese. I don't have absolute minimal pairs in each case. But there's basically there's a n w a n w o n and e n. These are the traditional. These are the rhymes of the che yun in which those occur. Uh, kai means there's no w before the vowel, and he means there is a w before the vowel. Remember, here we're talking about Middle Chinese, not Old Chinese. Okay. Uh, so just to account for this, unless we're going to include a w that can occur freely before the vowel, we need at least four Old Chinese vowels just to account for the contrasts of Middle Chinese on the basis of that assumption. So remember that we're assuming there's no w, just these labialized initials. Okay, clear so far? Yes. This proof in the last line. Uh, this is also a uh, he code. Well, I'm putting kai and he when there's a contrast. Uh, but yes. when I the huin uh, initial, uh, I mean, the huin rhyme includes nothing but uh, he code. So it's sufficient to just say it's the yeah. huin rhyme. Uh, but um, in old uh, Chinese, uh, there's also a uh, he code and uh, kai code. Well, I, I don't think kaiko and hoko are, are good terms to apply to Old Chinese. Old be Chinese. Because kaiko and hoko are terms which arise so late in the Tang Dynasty, okay? Yeah. Uh, and so they were originally uh, intended to represent Middle Chinese pronunciation. Um, and in Middle Chinese, you did indeed have this W element, which could occur before at least some of the vowels. And it didn't make, make that much difference what the initial was. So, but that hoko of Middle Chinese has two different origins in Old Chinese. One of which is the labialized initials like this. Mm -hmm. 
but the other is a rounded vowel. Okay, so hoko, uh, if you wanted to apply it to Old Chinese, I suppose you could, but it would mean that a hoko syllable is one which became hoko in Middle Chinese, or you could say it's either a syllable with a labialized initial or a syllable with a rounded vowel. But I think it's actually anach anachronistic to apply the term to Old Chinese. It's actually anachronistic, uh, strictly speaking, to apply the four divisions to, to early Middle Chinese, because those also are, th are terms which arose late in late Tang. Uh, they fit uh, late Middle Chinese better than early Middle Chinese, but uh, no harm is done. I mean, you can still have a, a terminology, and it has become conventional and traditional, to use a terminology based on late Middle Chinese to describe the phonology of early Middle Chinese. Uh, so I've been doing that, but so uh, I don't think, I mean, you run the risk of uh, giving the impression that from ever since Noah's flood, Chinese has had kaiko and hako and has had four divisions, right? And uh, it's just, uh, you know, different sets of categories are appropriate for different stages of the language. And so there are arguments about what really is the nature of the four divisions, for example. Uh, over and over again, I mean, there must be uh, hundreds and hundreds of papers written about what is the meaning of the uh, sidang, of the four divisions. And uh, I don't think it has a meaning. I think it has, it probably had a meaning at the time the terms were originally uh, used or developed. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean they were, it was a very good terminology even then, okay? But uh, to apply it backwards to old Chinese, uh, to even to early middle Chinese and to old Chinese, to think that there was that the four divisions had some nature that you can say what is the nature of uh, division one in in Middle Chinese even is is I think problematic. Uh, uh, so there's this na the danger of anachronism of uh, imagining or or essentialism imagining that there, these are eternal categories that Chinese has has always had and will always have. Other questions? Okay, but so you see, I can't use a W, like a, a, a element in Old Chinese by my hypothesis. This is part of the deductive part of the hypothetical deductive uh, process. I mean, we have a hypothesis that there was no uh, W glide in Old Chinese. So this is a, cons as it is a consequence of that, that all four of these Middle Chinese syllables have to be reconstructed with different vowels. Okay. So we have to have at least four. Yes, Stan. Uh, it comes from the defective distribution of this W in Middle Chinese. So, for example, although we do have uh, things like S W A N, T W A N, and so forth, we don't have syllables like Tuang or uh, Twen. So we have syllables like K W E N but no T-W-E-N. So the W occur before front vowels in Middle Chinese, the W only occurs with uh, back initials, like with velar initials or laryngeal initials. So it's that gap. I mean, you can often do a kind of internal reconstruction from the phonological pattern uh, and make some inferences about what an earlier stage of the language was like. So that to us was a clue that there was, uh, that was actually Yachentov that, that first um, thought about what that meant. And uh, he was the one that proposed the rounded vowel hypothesis for Old Chinese, which is part of this reconstruction. Uh, but you could do it for modern Mandarin. For example, you know, there's this complementary distribution. We have uh, jian, but we don't have gian, and we don't have zian, and we don't have jian. So the jian type syllables are in complementary distribution with the velars and the, and the uh, sibilants and the retroflex. 
And uh, well, in fact, uh, we know that they, we, we know there's an explanation for that because there are some man, man, Mandarin dialects still today which do have Gien and uh, Zien in contrast and they've just merged. So that's why we have just one uh, J-I-A-N type syllable uh, where there used to be you know, uh, a velar and a T-S type thing. So one of the places, by the way, where this uh, uh, distinction is still alive is in certain places in Shandong. Uh, in, in Mandarin, I mean, it's, there are plenty of uh, non-Mandarin dialects where it's there, but in Mandarin, there, it's still there in, uh, in uh, Shandong, and that is why Qingdao beer is spelled T-S, well, it's an oversimplification. That's why it's spelled T-S-I-N-G and not C-H or something like that because that's Qingdao, not, not uh, Qingdao in the local. Well, it's just an old way, it's just an old way of writing it, but it's kind of fun to point out. Okay, other questions? Okay. So, <coughs> If we're just looking at Middle Chinese, that would be probably, uh, we might be able to get by with those four vowels. But it turns out that uh, if you just take the E in, which is one of those Middle Chinese choices, it turns out that the, the, the traditional Chinese uh, linguists or ph uh, philologists had already figured out that this E in had three different origins in Old Chinese because words with E in can belong to three different, or a word in en can belong to one of three different uh, of, uh, traditional rhyme groups. So the word qian, d-z-e-n in Middle Chinese, is assigned to the yuan rhyme group. Um, that's generally reconstructed with some kind of an. And qian a thousand is uh, uh, part of the jun rhyme group. And uh, xian first is part of the wen rhyme group. Okay. <coughs> so that looks like then we are going to need at least six vowels because we had four, but one of them has three origins, so it has two more than what we had. So we need six vowels just for this. I don't know why this is like this, but so this is the way they work out. I've distributed the the e ends among their various rhyme groups. So. Uh, the A-N, W-A-N, and E-N all occur in the traditional Yuan rhyme group, okay? The E-N and the, uh, the other E-N, the one that you find in Xian, so both Xian and Zun are assigned to the traditional Wen rhyme group, and Qian is, belong is assigned to the Jun rhyme group. So if you put, sort of, take the Cartesian product, if you like, of the Middle Chinese uh, 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 syllable types in, in divisions one and four and the old Chinese rhyme types, you get uh, 12 different, I mean, sorry, six different uh, possibilities. You have to have these. And <coughs> now here's the crux of the matter. Uh, it, the question is, how seriously should you take the, the traditional uh, analysis of old Chinese rhymes? Um, Li Fanggui did not question the uh, as far as I know, did not question the traditional analysis, and that is why he reconstructs all of these syllables with an a-n. But in order to do that, he has to have a ua, it has to have a ua uh, nucleus and an ia nucleus, okay? And similarly, <coughs> to account for contrasts like sen and, and uh, zun in the one rhyme group, he has to re reconstruct I, well, what he did was reconstruct I schwa uh, in xian and schwa without an I in zun, and then the jun group is no problem, okay? But if these are all really different vowels, then this at least raises the possibility that what happened was that the traditional uh, scholars overlooked some rhyme distinctions uh, that the, uh, according to our assumptions, we need to reconstruct three different main vowels in the Yuan rhyme group, in the, in just in that rhyme group. So if the rhyming went by the main vowel, was according to main vowel, there should be three rhyme groups there and not just one, okay? And similarly with one, there uh, need to be two rhyme groups. There are two different vowels that we reconstruct there. We don't give ourselves the option of reconstructing this U before the main vowel or this I before the main vowel. 
Uh, and basically it's just a device to reconcile this uh, Middle Chinese pattern, which um, implies six different units, with the Old Chinese uh, rhyme groups that were uh, passed on to us from, from the Qing, Qing scholars. Uh, that's why you have these vowel clusters like this. So now when I first, uh, I guess it was in my uh, dissertation, I was working with the six vowel system but I had not checked this against the Shi Jing rhymes, and so I thought, uh, well, for all I knew, uh, I didn't really have any good reason to say that the, uh, that the Qing scholars were wrong. They said that words like Tsan and Swan and Qian all rhymed each with each other. They're in the same rhyme group. And so I said, well, maybe for all I know, by the time you get to the Shi Jing, O really had changed to something like Wa in this context, and E had changed to something like Ya in this context, and that would explain why these three words could rhyme with each other. And similarly with these, maybe this had changed, well, my analysis would have been a little different, but this uh, changed to one or something like that, so maybe these uh, did rhyme. But it, again, at least it suggests the hypothesis that uh, the, this rhyme analysis should be checked now. Uh, the, uh, on its face, this vowel system seems to predict that there aren't enough rhyme groups in the traditional analysis and some of them need to be divided into more. So the initial, the, the uh, Shi Jing, uh, analysis of Shi Jing rhymings uh, that, is, that was traditional uh, uh, is not, it, it's correct as far as it goes, but it's not sufficiently fine-grained. It doesn't, it doesn't recognize distinctions that were actually there. And remember, if you're analyzing the Shi Jing, if, you, if things rhyme in the Shi Jing that don't rhyme for you, that's easy to recognize. Remember we had Cai Cai Fo Yi, Wo Yan Yo Zhi, and Cai Zhi rhyming, Yo and Cai rhyming. So it, that's easy to detect. But uh, you can tell it by just looking at one poem, basically. But to establish that if there are cases where things didn't rhyme in Old Chinese, but do rhyme now, you will not notice them. And in t to get them, you will have to detect this. You have to look not just at a single poem, but you have to look at the whole corpus to verify. Whether, and you have to know what, what groups you're looking for. That is, you, it's very difficult to do it uh, purely inductively. Uh, it, so it's just, I'm trying to emphasize the sort of logical procedure here. And now we have a hypothesis which suggests a way to split the old Chinese uh, rhymes uh, into smaller groups. Uh, and if we were, if we did not have this hypothesis and all we had was the, was the Shi Jing rhymes and we were trying to do it empirically from the Shi Jing rhymes, we might never hit upon the right hypothesis about how to divide, uh, how to subdivide the Yuan group, for example. So it's quite uh, understandable that the Qing scholars did not detect these distinctions, if they were distinctions, which I will try to convince you of, because they did not reason in this way. I mean, they were not uh, thinking in terms of, uh, fu uh, of uh, vowel systems, okay? Uh, they did have a notion of phonology and distribution and things like that, but they were using different categories, and uh, we, are at a, we have a big advantage from using an alphabetic notation. Okay, so let's look. So uh, I'm just going to give you three rhyme sequences to show you that uh, these are illustrations of the fact that, in fact, there are three rhyme groups uh, corresponding to the traditional Yuan. One is A-N, and here's an example. This uh, from 82.1. You can, we'll put this up later, and you can see. Um, so this, each of, uh, well, yeah. These two words, this is the Middle Chinese, there's only one possible vowel that we can reconstruct, that we can use to reconstruct these Middle Chinese forms. Uh, A-N has to come from an A vowel. It can't come from an O-N, it can't come from an E-N. Okay, so according to our hypotheses, these two have to have on. Now, actually, we don't, are not sure whether, now, whether the coda is R or N. And I think in this case it's N, but uh, also even Yen, which has this A-E-N, the A-E, a uh, kind of, uh, uh, that's a division two vocalism. A-E normally represents uh, R-A, okay? 
there are other cases where it doesn't, but, but so at least this is consistent with that. This you might say, well, we might be able to reconstruct that with En, uh, maybe, maybe you couldn't do it with On, and, uh, but these two definitely have to be An, and so these are An all the way through. You clear about what I'm saying about this poem? It's just one stanza, okay. Okay. All right, here's an O-N sequence. Shu jian guan xi, ji ren luan luan xi, lao xin tuan tuan xi. Okay, these two words here have that W and they have an acute initial. That means that we do not have the option of reconstructing a, a, a labialized initial in Old Chinese. By our assumptions, these have to be reconstructed with an O vowel. They have to be reconstructed with a rounded vowel. There's no other way to get those Middle Chinese forms. Mm -hmm. Now, a form like guan could be either, right? It could e either represent K-O-N or K-W-A-N, right? So both possibilities exist. It turns out that words of this shape can be divided into the the KWAN types and the KON types, and words with this phonetic, this is the, in fact, the same phonetic that you, we find in Yuan, words with this phonetic uh, uh, have ON. I mean, that, that phonetic is used for ON words and not for KWAN words in general. Uh, so this is quite consistent with our hypotheses, and, and uh, this is, means either we're very lucky or the hypothesis is correct. Yes? Uh, I forget whether the O notation for Middle Chinese and Old Chinese have roughly the same phonetic content or not. And if uh, you said that perhaps it represented an unrounded... Uh, oh, no, no, I'm talking about real vowels now. So I'm not, notice the Middle Chinese forms don't have any O. So this, no, for Old Chinese, yeah, the difference is that for Old Chinese we really it's really a reconstruction. We really want it, so we use phonetic notation. The symbols mean what they're supposed to mean. Uh, the Middle Chinese notation, and we don't call it a reconstruction, at least uh, uh, we try not to uh, slip and call it that. Uh, it is a way of representing with alphabetic symbols, simple alphabetic symbols, the distinctions which can be derived from the traditional sources. And we make it Close, look as close to the, what's known about the phonology as we can, just for mnemonic uh, convenience. But there are plenty of cases where the notation is purely artificial, and that's why we have this O for an unrounded vowel. So, the, so when you, if you see something in Old Chinese, except for this, well, the, the doubling the initial consonant is sort of artificial, although it may have been that, we don't know, uh, some kind of gemination, but uh, no, this is a real O-N, okay? Other questions? All righty. So now here we find a sequence with en, three en words. Actually, all of these words have Middle Chinese en, and they cannot be reconstructed with an in any way. That is, there's no on source for these in Old Chinese, according to our assumptions. And so uh, either it's by chance, the three, word, uh, three words that we say ha had en in them happen to rhyme with each other in this poem so that it looks, like, looks good, but maybe it's just by chance. Uh, or else we're right, and uh, there is at least a strong tendency for an, on, and en to rhyme separately in Old Chinese. So uh, come back to my book, the main, uh, sort of the core in new stuff in the book is that I didn't just look at a, a few rhyme sequences like that. I looked at the whole corpus of Shi Jing rhymes, and I uh, applied this, uh, well, a rather complicated method to try to decide whether uh, the degree of separation in rhyming we find in cases like this could have been due to chance, or how, how likely is it that, it would, that we would find this degree of separation by chance. I've given you completely regular examples. There are a few cases in the Shi Jing where we have words which we, we reconstruct with en that, uh, and words that we reconstruct with an which rhyme with each other. So there are a few irregular rhymes from our point of view and on and an also. We don't actually have on and en, but we do have on and an and 
E-N and A-N. Uh, I have explanations or par probable explanations for those irregularities, but for the purposes of the test, I did not exclude them. I, I counted those to see how frequent they were and, uh, and the probability, well, it varies from group to group. Uh, in this, I don't remember, the probability is like one in a million or something that this, uh, that this degree of separation would have occurred by chance. So this is our, again, our hypothesis predicts that these should be uh, separated in rhyming unless we add some special assumption about uh, fuzzy rhyming or something. Uh, and that prediction is borne out by the, the pattern of the rhymes in the book. So that's basically what, what this did. So we not only have a six vowel system uh, suggested by the distribution of elements in, old, in Middle Chinese and the analysis of Old Chinese rhymes, which was traditional, we also have a prediction about Old Chinese rhyming, which is supported by the data. Now, I should say that this is not true in every case. For example, with the labial coda uh, syllables, there's simply not enough examples uh, to be statistically significant. Even if they're all regular, they wouldn't be stati statistically significant. There's just not enough of them. Okay. Yes? Sorry for interrupting. No, Just please. Check, uh, the, the analog for this O vowel would be the schwa. Uh, so for Middle Chinese, it, or you said at one stage that it replaced the, 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 the part I by schwa for sort of typological convenience. But, but in, in this, this case, case when, when you, when you, you reconstruct the schwa among the six vowels, it wouldn't be schwa and not. not uh, Absolutely. Well, well, no, no, I, I, I yeah, yeah, I lied. Um, um, actually, we, we, uh, of course, for all we know, people in, uh, you know, in north of the Yangtze used a mid vowel, and the and the people south of the Yangtze used a high vowel. You know, this is, it, but it, there are some reasons to believe that the vowel which has traditionally been written with schwa. Uh, is actually a high vowel because the ri it splits in rhyming. When you remember type A syllables, uh, in type A syllables, uh, the vowel is, is lowered. So things that used to rhyme, type A I N and type B I N rhyme in the Shi Jing, but they don't, they cease to rhyme in uh, somewhere around the Han Dynasty. Uh, whenever I say, I don't know when something happened, I just say it happened in the Han Dynasty. It's 400 years, you know. About like that, but, but no kidding. That's about about when this happened. And there was a similar split in the rhyming of schwa in that happened about the same time. That's the basic reason for assuming that what we write as a schwa is uh, is actually could be an, a high vowel. But uh, you know, I think that imagining that we can reconstruct such phonetic detail for the old Chinese period is probably uh, uh, an illusion anyway. And uh, it was only confusing people. Uh, so we, it's a kind of a compromise between the conventions of the of the field and the, uh, but it is indeed a, a non-front, unrounded vowel, non-front, unrounded, non-low vowel. Whether it was mid or high, I don't know. Other questions? And just to continue on yeah. Spain. The schwa has a uh, an implication in many languages that it's a reduced vowel. It's really central. So it's used in many cases for unstressed vowels. So that would be another reason. But there are lots of parameters. So that's just one reason that you might make a note somewhere that it's you intend it as a vowel that has this and that, this right. and that characteristic. I don't think that the, yeah, I think that this... Uh, yeah, well, people are not very consistent about how they use schwa. Indeed, you're right. There's a convention of saying, well, if it's an unstressed vowel, you know, without much of a distinction, we'll just write it as schwa. That's more or less what we did in these uh, uh, minor syllables, right? That's why we write it with a schwa. Um, but there is a, you have to, I have to consider the audience uh, as well, because uh, uh, already the schwa, I mean, I'm trying to write not just for linguists, but also for people who are working on early texts who are not trained as linguists. And uh, even the schwa, they don't get right. I won't name names, but, but uh, it, 
you would think that it would be possible to copy a, a reconstructed form accurately from the source in front of you to your own manuscript, but if it does not happen that way. So uh, uh, even with otherwise you know, brilliant uh, scholars, they seem to be, have trouble with this. So by now I think though, it, if any weird symbol is familiar to people, it's the schwa, right? So they're used to having schwas in this. And throwing in, like, uh, I, I guess I would prefer all other things being equal to use this uh, rotated M. Uh, but uh, that would really, that would be a total mess. It would either come out as U or as M or N or two N's or, you know, who knows. So I, I'm sorry uh, that, uh, I mean, from a purely, uh, from a linguist's point of view, there, there's some things about the notation which uh, seem undesirable, but we have taken these, th we would do it that way if we thought we could communicate well with that system. Okay, what's happening here? Oh. Do I have two copies of this slide? Yes, I do. Okay, so now what I started doing here is I, uh, I started going through vowel by vowel to show you more or less what happens in these uh, uh, in, in the development of finals. Uh, obviously one main uh, conditioning factor is whether the syllable is type A or type B. Well it got to be rather er late last night or early this morning when I was still, uh, had not gone through the whole set and I think uh, I would uh, have had trouble keeping your attention if I had actually been exhaustive about it. I think the examples that I have will, get, will be sufficient to show you the main principles of how the uh, finals develop. Uh, basically, the picture has not changed, except for the notation, uh, the picture has not changed a great deal since my book, so if you want to know the, de the details of it, uh, my book is still okay for this part. Uh, uh, but this will give you some idea of the main processes involved. So we have, uh, we have a distinction between type A and type B. We have syllables with and without R before the vowel. Um, uh, the KW and Q, we, I use a Q, a capital Q is sort of an abbreviation for uvulars. The, the labiovelars and the labiouvulars generally work like K and uh, the, the unrounded ones, but they have a W before the vowel. But sometimes, yeah, in, in type A that's generally the case. It's generally the same except that there's a W before the vowel. Uh, now, P could occur before either rounded or unrounded vowels, as labial initials could occur before either unrounded or rounded vowels. So for example, the, uh, um, uh, let's see, fa jan, the fa, this, uh, that character, if you know, if you know the Chinese, uh, uh, we reconstruct with, as P-A-T, but to fa da fa, or fa, whatever, uh, is P-O-T. And they have different phonetics, and generally speaking, the, the fa jan, the fa phonetic, represents P-A-T, and the, f and the to fa da fa phonetic, if you can visualize, do, should I write the characters? Okay. Uh, the to fa da fa, which is like, right? Um, is P-O-T, okay. Uh, so there was, now there was no W contrast after P, there was no labialized and unlabialized label, labials, but there was a, a contrast of rounded and un, unrounded vowels, at least in some context, maybe not all. Uh, but by the time you get to Middle Chinese, uh, there is absolutely no contrast between a presence or absence of W in syllables with labial initials. So, uh, for example, what I state that as a general rule that uh, CCAT goes to CAT and CCOT goes to CWAT, if you applied that with P, then you would think that PAT should give, P PPAT should give PAT, PPOT should give PWAT, but there's an extra step and that is that the W is lost at some point, or the, the contrast, the rounding contrast is lost. So there is no P-W-A-T in Middle Chinese. 
This was another thing, by the way, that Carlgren didn't seem to notice and was pointed out, uh, or at least brought to general attention by Zhao Yanren in his uh, review of Carlgren's Grammaticerica in uh, HJAS. I, I, th I want to remind myself to uh, upload that. I have a copy of it, so. We can put that on the site. It's a very useful uh, document, especially if you ever find yourself using Carlgren, which we do all the time, and you may very well wind up as well. Okay. So uh, let's look at syllables uh, with the uh, type A syllables with a schwa. Okay. So general form is CC schwa C. Uh, if it's an open syllable, the schwa and the, and the uh, uh, when there was a zero coda, it acquired a, uh, uh, a yod off glide at some point. So schwa and schwa j, which are distinct in, middle, in Old Chinese, uh, in type A syllables, they merged in Middle Chinese. Okay. So this is, and you can again, you can look at rhyming to see more or less when this happened. Uh, there is a point up to which uh, schwa and schwa j rhyme separately, and then after that, schwa j and schwa rhyme interchangeably more or less. I don't know, it's probably in four fi 400 or 450, something like that. And of course, it's probably different for different areas. Now, there's one crucial step, and that, oh, why did I do that? I didn't mean to do that. Oh, I see what happened, yes. Um, there's one crucial step which makes it, is why we can use six units where Li Fang Gui used seven. And that is that his I Shua and his schwa, uh, well, it's not quite, anyway, the distribution is such that you can reduce his seven to six because the I schwa is really schwa and some of his schwas are really you, okay? So uh, let me go back and just show you this. Okay, you notice in Xian, uh, he writes I schwa here. For us, there's no I there, it's just a schwa, but there is, but schwa in that environment where both the initial and the coda were uh, acute or coronal, uh, the vowel was fronted. That was a general process, and uh, that is, recognizing that one change is what made it possible to reduce the number of units from seven to six. Notice that, that uh, Li Fang Gui uses a schwa in this syllable, although it's a, it's a, uh, has a W in Middle Chinese. So he has a rule by which un changes to wun uh, between Old Chinese and Middle Chinese. Well, actually, this is, uh, this is not a schwa in, it's a yu in. Uh, in other environments, say, gun, the word uh, root, he just reconstructs a k schwa in. That does not give you kun. I mean, zun gives you zun, but uh, kun does not give you so uh, for, for Li, the difference, the development of schwa was one thing after uh, acute initials and another thing after uh, uh, grave initials, okay? It rounded after acute but not after grave. Uh, that's not so, okay? That's just a mistake. And in fact, if you look at the acute initial syllables which, uh, which he c reconstructs with schwa in but we reconstruct with u in, and the grave initial uh, syllables, which he constructs with schwa in, and we construct with schwa in, they never rhyme with each other in the in the shijing. Absolutely never. Okay. So um, uh, this was just a mistake. So these should really be a u, as we have it. Once you've made, once you've substituted u for schwa here, then that leaves you free to use schwa in these syllables, and you do have a, a special uh, you know, in, in that special context, schwa was fronted. So let's go back up here, and then I, yeah, I give some examples here. So, uh, so this is the, that uh, process. When you have a schwa between C1 and C2, and both C1 and C2 are acute or coronal, then the Middle Chinese result is a front e. Uh, in type B, it works the same way. It's an i instead of an e, but, it, but uh, uh, the, the schwa is fronted in general between those two in that environment. But otherwise, the schwa remains a back vowel. 
Uh, and it's what we write as an O in Middle Chinese, but it really, we would really like to write that. Some people are scratching their heads. Uh, does that mean you uh, have a question, or did that go too fast? Okay, now let me finish this page, and then we'll see if there's anything else. Uh, so, all right, so here are some examples of these developments. This is the word for cup. It's just PP schwa. As I said, it, when there's a zero coda, a, a J is added before you get to Middle Chinese. It's treated as if it's P-W-O-J, but there's no contrasting P-O-J uh, in Middle Chinese. Uh, we put a W there so that you can identify the Che Yun rhyme that you'll find it in. Okay. Uh, so this is, then this works out as Bei. Uh, Xian is a case where this uh, fronting rule applies, as I showed you, so S-S Shua R. Well, it comes out as uh, S-E-N, and the main development is R to N. Uh, but notice you do have words with this phonetic like xi to wash, which have a J instead of an N. And that's one of the pieces of evidence that tells us that the xian had an R and not an N at the end. Uh, okay, but anyway, so that's what happens there. Uh, but otherwise, you've basically got uh, some kind of a, uh, an uh. So he, it was muk. Uh, this changes to a ch, so you have chok, and that comes out as uh, he. Anybody speak Cantonese? Well, I can speak without fear of contradiction then, but a uh, <laughs> uh, Cantonese word for black is uh, hak. And, uh, of course, it's koku in uh, Japanese and so forth. Mun, uh, we believe now had an R at the end as well. Uh, not sure about that, that's why it's in brackets. Uh, this is an unrounded vowel, and we get, uh, but again, the inch, uh, anyway, it gets uh, muan and, and, uh, and it's mun in Mandarin. Uh, hua had a uvular initial, that's why we get glottal stops and things like that in this series. Uh, and that just comes out as hua, and that's uh, hua, and that's, uh, I guess it's wa in Cantonese. Yes? Absolutely. Well, at least in the Middle Chinese sources that we have. Yeah, because I, I just um, I, I, I had an example for a transcription of a Sokya name. Mm -hmm. um, there was apparently an R in it, so I checked. You're you. talking about Anxi yeah, yeah. or Anso or whatever it is? No, no, I, no, no it, was, it was a name. It was, I, I don't know, it was a different text. So, I, But I have to check, and um, I checked your book because I was sure there wasn't an R. Well, my book won't tell you about this because yeah. we added the R after Yeah, yeah, the I know, I know. So um, I, I was always sure that there was never an R in um, a Chinese, Chinese as a final. So, um, of course, this changes things. And is it possible that maybe uh, this transcription may just preserve um, an older um, being? Well, so those Sogdians the were there for anyway. a long yeah, time, know, right? Yeah. So, uh, so I don't know if the character is liable We do to have this uh, Arsak uh, yeah. name that's transcribed with An. Yeah. King and and uh, I have been worrying for at least... Uh, 13 years as to whether that means that 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 on ends in an R. I think it may yeah, may be, but the thing is that once you get started with changing these ends to R's, it's hard to know where, when to stop. Uh, you know, maybe you've got one rhyme here and you say, okay, if it rhymes with that, it must have had an R. And then it's written with that phonetic, so that must have had an R. So that's why uh, we put the square brackets in a lot of cases. Uh, the strongest evidence for an R in our opinion, is when we have both N and J codas in the same phonetic series. So for Shen, I don't think there's a problem. Uh, for Mun, we don't have that. We may turn out to have some variant somewhere. But uh, of course, it is true that if you don't have an R coda, and you're trying to transcribe uh, a foreign word which does have an R coda, then you will uh, uh, probably, you know, you're forced to make the best of it, and you might very well choose your N. Uh, but at least some foreign words with R are transcribed with R, occur early enough that they are transcribed with R, and one of them was Chan Yu, remember? Yeah. Uh, and that, that series definitely has an R. We're not reconstructing it because of that word. We're reconstructing it because of the phonetic series. And uh, so it has to be an R, uh, and it's sure enough, it's an R, in, in, in at least in this very similar-looking word in Mongolian. 
uh, which are not confined to Mongolian, I think it occurs all over the place, but uh, uh, so I don't know. Uh, it's quite possible, of course, even if the text is from uh, the Middle Chinese period, uh, the source that they were using, I mean, unless they're talking about somebody contemporary, and if, it's, if they're talking about old stuff, they may have used old documents. And, and these names still stick around. I mean, we still use Chan Yu, right, for, for, uh, for the, uh, this uh, uh, Xing Lu chieftain or something. Other questions? Yeah, I think I mentioned that the R's are really, uh, a lot of them are unsolved. You'll see over and over again, we'll put an N in square brackets. It's because, uh, actually, on the, when we were walking back to Laurent's house last night, I think we came up with what might be a procedure to test this. And we were, it was suggested by Sven's question yesterday of whether we had actually tr done a statistical test. And I was saying, I was pessimistic about being able to, but I think it might, I think we may have figured out a way to do it. And, uh, uh, or, or a technique that might help to put us on firmer ground here. Okay, any other questions about this? Okay, let's go on. If you have type A but there's an R, uh, generally fronting distinctions are lost after R. The R's, I don't know why, but it seems to have had the, well, it, it definitely had the effect of fronting the following vowel. Uh, why an R would do that, I don't know. But, but what we write as an R uh, seems to have uh, obliterated uh, the front-back distinction in the following vowel uh, pretty dependably. And uh, in general, it, uh, it make the result seems to be front by the time you get to Middle Chinese, at least. So here's a case, my, uh, to bury. Well, notice the phonetic already support, supports the, sh the R schwa here, so this is one of these cases. Uh, Jachentuf had already discovered these cases. He was also responsible for the idea of reconstructing an R in, in Division II. It was originally an L, but that's okay. We don't know what, whether this is a mr, and we don't know whether this is a pre-syllable or, the, you know, not sure of the uh, analysis here, but in any case, it comes out as Division II here. So schwa, R schwa normally gives EA, there are a few cases where there's no A-E-E-A -E -E distinction. For example, there's, a, there's an A-E-W in Middle Chinese, um, the Yao rhyme, but there's no E-A-W in Middle Chinese. Uh, so apparently what had, it, there may have been a contrast, it would have been something like a contrast between Ao and Eo. Uh, probably, and uh, in, some contra in some environments you do have that contrast in the Middle Chinese sources. Most dialects lost it entirely anyway, so probably already by the time of the Che Yun, there were dialects which did not have an E-A-A-E contrast. This A and this E were uh, simply uh, uh, had merged. Uh, but where they're distinguished, they do make sense in Old Chinese terms, and uh, I believe I, I haven't written this up, but I'm pretty sure that I can prove to, to you that the Min dialects do reflect a di I mean, the ancestor of the Min dialects has to have had this distinction because the EA words come out with different reflexes from the AE words. Uh, s okay, so Xian, uh, obstacle or limit, here we got R schwa in maybe, and it comes out as EAN. This word, this dreadful word for cutting off the head, uh, is, uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, also, a measure word for severed heads, right? <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, very useful. Uh, anyway, this also had an R, so forth. Uh, yeah, this I put this in just because, just to show that the uh, uh, this KS going to uh, the K being lost before S. So in Middle Chinese sources, this is Chusheng, and uh, this is what we get. But uh, actually, in, in most, of the, most of the time when you see this in uh, early texts, uh, I don't remember about the Shijing. In the Shijing, I'm pretty sure it rhymes. And it rhymes as if it was just a K, not a, a KS. Uh, or there is a distinction between S and, I mean, there is, the S does usually show up in rhyming. But some of the words which, in middle, which the Middle Chinese sources tell us are Chusheng, rhyme in Old Chinese as if they are Rusheng, as if they had had no S. So probably there were two forms, one with an S and one without. There was a K form and a KS form. 
Uh, the f folks in Old Chinese time knew which were which, uh, but by the time you get to Middle Chinese, uh, the, one of them has been lost and, uh, or you know, there's been leveling, and so uh, we, we can't tell the difference anymore. And then here's another this word. Uh, this is actually, uh, I should put brackets around this. this. We would expect this to be pronounced kwai, but it's pronounced kui in, in Mandarin. There are a lot of irregular things in Mandarin, yeah. Here? Your intuition means one way? Because in the last slide... Oh, no, we don't, we don't go by intuition. We go by evidence, <laughs> okay? So what, what is the, the difference between R between brackets and N between brackets? Oh, well, there, I, I grant you, it's, uh, that's more or less... Those are, uh, shall we say, extensionally equivalent, okay? Mm -hmm. It means it... it we think it's an R, but it might actually, no, they're not, they're, yeah. yeah. Sometimes, if it's in brackets, we do sometimes put our best guess rather than, yeah. But, uh, but this is, abs we would never choose the, uh, we never write a plain R without, ab you know, on the basis of intuition. Mm -hmm. And this is not on the basis of intuition either, it's on the basis of rhymes, but I haven't er analyzed the rhymes thoroughly enough to convince myself that, mm -hmm. for sure, that it's an R. Well, if actually in the case of an, if in this case, this is probably we should put an N here because in some cases we can't tell whether it's an R or a J, okay? So I should probably reserve this notation for that. Uh, it's probably just, uh, I shouldn't do it this way. Now that you mention it, you're, I think you're right. Uh, but this means that, uh, well, there is some reason to think this might have had an R, but, but in many, many cases, we can't be uh, entirely sure. Okay, so let's move. That's we're through with schwa. Let's go to ah. This is going to take quite a while here. How, what time is it? It's ten, past three. ten past three. So another half hour. Okay. Well, I'll uh, go move on to type B before too long. So uh, even if we're not quite through with type A, but this will give you the, an idea of the processes. So an open syllable A or an A with, a, with the glottal stop, which uh, don't ask me why that doesn't count as a closed syllable, but uh, probably it had disappeared by the, before this, the, the, uh, it had changed before these, uh, the relevant, by the time the change occurred, it probably was an open syllable or something. Uh, generally, uh, an A ah in type A remains an A ah in Middle Chinese. But it does uh, change to an, an U or maybe it was an O. This is just an artificial notation, remember, uh, for Middle Chinese. So this uh, ancestor is like this. Uh, hu, uh, fox, this is a, happens to look nice from a Tibetan Burman point of view. Uh, we can't tell from Middle Chinese that there's a W there, but we can tell from the character that there has to be a W because the phonetic is gua uh, melon. Okay. Uh, and that ha that's division two, and in division two, the W is, is preserved. Uh, G is just gai. Uh, in AJ, as I mentioned earlier, the J gets lost in the main development. It's still there in, in some conservative dialects, including uh, Min. Uh, by the way, uh, another group of these, I, mean, I mentioned that Min is not the only group of dialects where we can probably find traces of early stuff that can't be accounted for in Middle Chinese. Definitely what's called Southern Wu is also in that category. So Wenzhou also has I for Ge Bu. Uh, and the thing is that Wu is simply not a valid uh, uh, taxon. Uh, they're called Wu for b because they share, the, all of the dialects that are called Wu are called Wu because they share a retention, not an innovation the retention of the voiced initials. And so there's really no good reason to believe that uh, Southern Wu and Northern Wu are, are, are in the same subgroup. Uh, there's no reason to, good reason to put them together. And uh, if you look at, in terms of innovations, uh, Northern Wu shows innovations which Southern Wu does not, such as this changing of ah, I to ah. Uh, and so Southern Wu is also an, uh, uh, an area where we haven't really done it yet, but, but there's another area where we can look for traces of early stuff, and that needs to be built into the reconstruction also. 
uh, done. Uh, here we again we're sure of the R, but uh, it just stays. The a vowel remains. Uh, uh, bad or ugly. Uh, it's just ak in uh, Middle Chinese. Notice, remember, one of the things. I don't know if uh, if uh, Laurent mentioned this actually, but one of the things that S sometimes do is changes an an adjective to a verb, uh, a putative verb or something. So hate is comes from uh, Q-Q-A-K-S, right? That's Wu, okay? And since it's K-S, it changes to S. That the S drops, it becomes an open syllable. The A ah changes to U as it, would in, as it did in ancestor. So that's how you have uh and Wu. So uh and Wu are parallel to Hao and Hao, okay? Hao and Hao are easy to recognize because they haven't changed, they're not that different. But because uh, uh is Rusheng, uh, the uh, Middle Chinese reflexes of this S uh, are more dramatic in the case of uh and wu. And there are many, many pairs like this. Okay, and gai uh, is to cover. Uh, that has an S. We, well, I probably should have put KKAPS -K -K goes to KKATS goes to JH because the, we know there's, that was an intermediate step. But this is one of the phonetics which still indicates a labial coda. Okay. So whoever was designing the writing system uh, knew that this word had a labial or something. From the phonetic. Yes, uh, from the phonetic. Well, I wasn't clear from the, this morning, but the, 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 all your initials are between uh, brackets? The what? All the initials are between well, this is because we're not, well, the one initial that we're sure of here is the T. We don't have, in, we only have one source for T. But affricates can come sometimes from an S before a, a pre, you know, a stop. Uh, voiced initials have several sources. This could be an M, a prefix in front of something. Uh, the, this, uh, often we do write a K, but the reason this is in brackets is because uh, this uh, phonetic series also includes things that have to be reconstructed with uvulars. So, but, but it's such a large series, we think parts of it may have been uh, velar after all. We, we, you know, if, it, if the phonetic is common enough and if it's already used for a, a uvular word that had a velar reflex because it was after, uh, uh, because it was in intervocalic position, then somebody can come along and use that character as a phonetic for a velar initial word that never had a, a uvular initial. So we can have these intrusions of velars into what had been uvular sil syllables, uh, so uvular phonetic series, rather. Uh, well, this is probably okay. It's just that, well, we're worried about, actually, uh, somebody asked if there was a zero initial. Was that spent? Oh, yeah, it was you. Um, we think there might have been, and uh, so there might have been a difference. Uh, the, the, the zero initial might also have come out as a glottal stop. And uh, in fact, there do seem to be series which have not just glottal stop, but all sorts of other things like X and NG and things like that, which indicate that they're uvulars. But there are other series which has absolutely nothing but glottal stop from top to bottom. And uh, so one of the possibilities is that that's not just chance, but maybe that those series really had a zero initial or had a glottal stop initial or something like that. So uh, that's why we still are putting the brackets around this, because this series, as far as I know, has nothing but glottal stop initials. Uh, so maybe it would, anyway, that's our, that's our excuse. If, if there were, if there were, X's or NG's or something el in that series, we would, we would take the brackets out. But the brackets are there because this series, as far as we know, from just looking at GSR, which is not necessarily sufficient, but just looking at GSR, it has nothing but uh, glottal stop initials. And then again, this could be either, uh, you can get a velar from a uvular if there's a prefix, uh, if there's a presyllable, so. So that also is that way. Okay, so we're leaving a lot of bets open. Uh, this uh, pre-syllable here is there because this word in min has a softened initial. We should probably, uh, well, we don't really know whether min, 
We know men had a, a pre-initial. We don't know that the pre-initial was there everywhere, so that's, you know, so we're sort of stuck. But uh, uh, anyway, that's why it's in, in brackets. All right, uh, moving right along. Uh, uh, a in type A syllables with R almost always just goes to AE. Yeah, in fact, th there's one or two minor exceptions which I won't trouble you with, but this, uh, these are interesting actually from the point of view of uh, this uh, uvular theory. I think I mentioned that, well, no, this was in my uh, journée talk. Uh, Laurent mentioned this morning that one of the characteristics of uvulars is that they can, that certain combinations of nasal plus uvular give you an, a velar nasal initial in Middle Chinese, an NG initial. Whereas we don't have any regular process that would do that with a, reg with a velar. So if we see an NG in an initial in a phonetic series, that's usually, a, we usually take that to be a sign that uh, at least that word had a uvular initial and not a velar initial. Um, and this works out nicely because uh, actually you, it's not reflected this way in Carlgren's uh, GSR, but uh, ya, tooth, is phonetic in yu, to give, right? Uh, that has a Y initial, and that one of the sources for a Y is the uh, voiced uvular stop, capital G. Okay, so we have two different reasons to believe that the, that there were uvulars here. The Y, when you have Y in the same series with uh, with velars, like you have U and G, right? Uh, that indicates that's an indication of uvulars. Uh, the fact that you have an ing that you have an ing, phonetic, ing initial phonetic in the word u is an, an, a second reason for believing that there are uvulars there. Kay. So it's when these things interlock or where, you, where they, you accumulate different arguments from different directions that agree uh, that we think we're on the right track. I mean, we take that as a sign we're on the right track. This is an interesting case because uh, this character is normally read hua. Oh, so, shoot. Uh, or hua when it's a, a surname and so forth. Uh, uh, but now, so when, it mean, when it's read hua, it means flowery, but there's also a word hua which for flower, which is nowadays written this way. But uh, this is a late character, and you can tell because this character implies a j rather than a as the uh, rhyme. This hua itself uh, has a uvular initial, it, it's X, it's just like this except it's Chushan. Uh, but it comes from Ge Bu, it comes from the AJ rhyme group and not from the A rhyme group. But I think I pointed out yesterday that RA, in type A, RA and RAJ merged. Okay. And this character reflects that merger. So once you see somebody using this character for, for flower, you can be sure that that merger has already occurred in that, for that person. So that's a way of dating that and maybe placing that, that merger. But in earlier texts, uh, whether it's hua or hua, it's, it's written this way, in both ways. Uh, uh, I guess tomorrow I may show you an interesting thing from the Shanghai text and with this written a different way. Uh, ke is a karak, uh, xia, a word for wheel, axle, cap, a useful word, uh, is uh, xia, has also had an R. This is gong. Uh, you might think this doesn't look regular. This gong is the regular reflex of guang in uh, uh, Middle Chinese, guang, that's just what happened. The guang went to guang and the guang went to gong or something like that. Okay. All right, I probably need to skip ahead. Uh, these are just more examples. You can come back and look at them. Uh, uh, oh, this is, yeah, this, uh, this was late at night. Uh, this is in the wrong place anyway. Need to fix it. Um, this is this one of the words for, for hole in the ground. This is a word for pit, which we think was uh, K-K-H-O-M glottal stop, and that's the one, I mean, we suspect that that may be the same etymon as kong and as kwan. Just to confirm, confirmation, so in this now example, there would be a loss of rounding from all to middle Chinese. Well, yes and no. 
um, what there's a loss of the rounding distinction, okay? So I've said that we think it's often a, an unrounded vowel, but in fact, uh, the, if you look at, uh, th there are plenty of uh, dialects where, which suggest that in this, th this kind of word would be om in, with a rounded vowel. Mm -hmm. So uh, a word like this, for instance, in the, uh, in the Xiajiang uh, Guanhua, well, not, it's the, Tung Tai Fang Yan, it's north of uh, Shanghai. These word, this, a word like this would come out as uh, Kung, okay? Uh, whereas if it were an Am, it would come out as, uh, well, no, uh, that, well, never mind. But I mean, th there are dialect reflexes. If you were just going by modern dialect, you might well uh, uh, reconstruct a rounded vowel here. Uh, but the point is that there's no contrast between rounding and unrounding uh, anymore in uh, before labial codas in Middle Chinese. Even after grave initials? Even after grave initials. Okay. Anything else? Uh, this word, by the way, uh, uh, there are a lot of uh, M words and, uh, and actually the word bian hua de bian also is in this series. This word for harness bells, which we think was moron, uh, this occurs in Thai as a uh, bruan, well, in Siamese, I guess it's something like uh, pruan, uh, but uh, you reconstruct bruan, and it means harness bell. Uh, and it's clearly a loan word. Maybe it could have gone in the other direction, I guess. It's possible that we have a B through, uh, an intrusive B between the M and the R, which would not be too surprising. I'm not sure why we have a B in, in uh, uh, or maybe the M is wrong, I don't know. But What's that? Is it or what is it? Yeah, I don't know why I put, uh, that's, these are just taken straight out of the database. And I, at some point, thought I had a reason for putting an L there, but I don't think it was anymore. It was a very good reason. I just haven't changed it in the database. So I think, I, I don't think that's a very good uh, idea. No, we don't actually. We, uh, I mean, we're telling you there is no such thing. So, so it uh, that the only thing can uh, that can occur in that position is R, except well, I don't know. You can have complex initials though. So, but but the complex initials shouldn't have anything aspirated in the pre-initial, right? So, so this shouldn't occur. You're right. It's just an error. And the, the ten thousand records in the database. Okay, so this is this does happen. Okay. Uh, oh, one interesting thing here is, uh, uh, I just, no, I'll skip it, never mind. All right, let's go to uh, uh, type B. Uh, type B developments are typically more complex uh, than type A. That's why I didn't have time to finish them last night. Uh, but for example, in this case, uh, if you have, this is a type A single uh, initial, if you have P schwa K, uh, with K standing for any K type initial, uh, K-type coda, rather, uh, this rounds. So the vowel is uh, assimilated in a type to the initial in a type uh, uh, B syllable. So in type B syllables, not just the initial consonant, but also the vowel uh, seems to be, in type A syllables, not just the, the initial consonant, but also the vowel seems to be more resistant to change than in type B, where things can go all different directions. So uh, uh, here's an example. The word which we now read as bu, actually in, in modern dialects, the, there is no such reading. Uh, it's always, it, it's a, it implies that, I mean, the, the, if you can reconstruct from modern dialects, you get a form with a final T. Like uh, this character is read but in Cantonese. But that's, an that's a new, a late development. And in classical texts, uh, we have every reason to believe that it was read just pu. But that p went to what we write as pu, okay? And I should put square brackets around this because it's really not the reflex of this. Uh, there's a bunch of uh, words with labialized initials and schwa vowel. This is so-called zhibu, which wind up uh, with a vow rounded vowel in Middle Chinese. So this uh, qiu, uh, the personal name of uh, Confucius, among other things, uh, was something like kuo, and then the rounding here get, got spread to the vowel. Uh, gung, the word for bow, 
was kuang, it rhymes that way, you can see, but it, uh, then it, it merges with kung by Middle Chinese times. This is the same thing as if you had gotten uh, kung. This is the same as if, you, if it had been ku. And then just to show one that didn't happen that way, this is the usual thing actually with uh, shi is uh, hluk. Uh, and uh, you just get ik. That's the, that's the main development here. Questions? So K in the capital K here mean includes zero, K, and ing, velar nasal. In all of those it happens. So here's the velar nasal example. Uh, yes. Yes. Uh, well, uh, cup is PP schwa. In Old Chinese. Oh, in Middle, middle Chinese, Chinese the, you know, the, the, cap, the type A went in a different direction. It goes to P-W-O-J, yeah. right? Well, it's because one's type A and one's uh, type B. I mean, there's an independent thing going on, and that's the uh, addition of a glide after the vowel. Uh, so that, that's an, a complicating thing. And Probably many dialects had a uh, rounded vowel in that word, and that's probably why the the cheyun, the W is there because the cheyun puts it in a rhyme which otherwise has only W O J. Uh, and in Man in Cantonese, the word for cup is bui, uh, right? So uh, uh, so it just you know they went their separate ways because one was type A and one was type B. And of course, this becomes quite mystifying. I mean, the, the phonetics, which were really uh, pretty much on the money uh, until 2,000 years ago or so, have now become very confusing. And that's a point we'll come back to tomorrow morning uh, and the nature of the writing system. Now, one of the interesting things about an, if you have an R in type B, it blocks this rounding assimilation. So uh, with the s again, with the same phonetic, we have uh, P meaning great, uh, and uh, here in order to account for this reflex, the front reflex, we put an R in there. So the R, as it usually does, fronted the vowel and uh, prevented the assimilation, uh, prevented the rounding of the vowel under the influence of the initial consonant. Yes? Um, it may not be the right time to ask this question, it's a general question, but there's more evidence from neighboring languages reconstructing the actual pronunciation of Middle Chinese words more than there is for Old Chinese. And so how come one has less confidence in providing actual phonetic approximations or suggestions for the values of the Qiyun categories than for the six vowels of Old Chinese where you were pretty sure that more confident about their phonetic reality? Well, uh, first of all, there's a lot of stuff ab about Middle Chinese that's really absolutely clear. So, for example, if it starts with a T, it's a T, right? Uh, if it had a W in it, it probably had a W in it. So there are many features of Middle Chinese that are, uh, that are pretty clear. And the reason it, they're clear is probably because all the major dialects were consistent on that point. But the reason for the unclarity is that we have no reason to believe that a single synchronic system is being represented. So uh, uh, it is simply a, a system of pronunciation which is in these books. Uh, we don't even know if people talked like that. The most we can really assume is that this is the way they pronounced the words when they were reciting or repeating classical texts aloud. Okay, I think that's a, sort of the minimal assumption. So we don't think they're totally made up out of nothing, but a, and uh, they they correlate well with, uh, as you say, with uh, loan words in other languages and things like that. But the loan words in other languages often represent different, ver slightly different varieties of speech. They don't all represent one dialect. Uh, and different layers of loan words represent different dialects. So it's mostly because it's not a single uh, synchronic system. Okay. Uh, I, I sometimes use the example of, uh, of an American diction, the pronunciations in an American dictionary um, um, well, anyway, I, I won't 
go through the whole deal, but in fact, no one, as far as I know, makes all the distinctions that are made in the pronunciation entries in American dictionaries, because most of us have one fewer vowel than, the, than is marked, and uh, except in uh, Eastern New England, and uh, uh, not everybody has w versus hua, but that'll always be marked and th things like that. So, the, so we needn't exaggerate the artificialness of the of the Middle Chinese system, uh, but in fact, uh, it it we can't treat it as if it were a synchronic uh, phonological system of a of an actual uh, language. Okay. Other, uh, well, let's go on down here. This is kind of nice. The word for tortoise uh, uh, is uh, kura. Uh, again, the same sort of thing happens as with the labial initials. Uh, and uh, this yu. Uh, again, why would you have guo and yu written with the same phonetic? Well, it's all because one is type A and one is type B and one has an R and one doesn't have an R. And uh, if you go back to the old Chinese, it's not that different, but uh, you got something like wick in Middle Chinese and then yu in Mandarin. Uh, Bing is interesting because uh, we have very, in this case, we have very direct evidence for the R. Uh, in quite a few cases we do, actually, but we have very direct evidence for the R in this case because there's also a doublet, there's a form ling, uh, which uh, L-I-N-G in Middle Chinese, which also means ice. And... Uh, and there are various, I think we may even have disyllabic forms, I'm not sure, but, but uh, anyway, there, there it's very clear that this had an, uh, an R, and that uh, accords with the fact that it does not assimilate. We would exp if it did not have the R, it would come out as feng, but because of the R, it comes out as uh, bing, and so forth. And the bottom is just what you usually have. Uh, Okay, well, if you had the T coda in type B, um, you had the same fronting process that you had in type A when both the initial and the, and the coda were acute. Uh, and this has been overlooked in some cases, actually. <coughs> but, uh, but you also have assimilation, apparent kinds of assimilation, um, uh, when the vowel, when the initial is, uh, is either labial or labialized. Uh, and you also have an additional distinction that's present after grave initials that's not there after acute initials because this process happened after acute initials but not grave initials. So there are more contrasts after grave initials than after acute initials. But th this word, <coughs> I don't care what dictionary you look at it up in, <coughs> it will be treated as if it is I schwa. Uh, it just, it's just a historical accident because uh, Wang Li got it wrong in his 1937 paper, and everybody goes by that paper, but if you look at the rhyming, it's very clear that this rhymes as schwa J, never as I J, <coughs> and it's fronted by this same process. I don't think any of the rest of that's too difficult unless somebody has a question. On what? Yeah. <coughs> well, we probably should. Um, it's probably just a mistake. Uh, I, well, I don't. We don't have a p prefix. Okay. So if it's a p pre syllable if it occurs at all. And the fact that we have a ling form suggests that we did have a prob. I mean, our explanation for that would be that there was a disyllabic form where the f uh, where the minor syllable got lost. Just as with uh, the words for writing brush, you know, we had cases uh, where where the f some dialects had lost the first syllable. Um, so we should probably put a period in here, but we we shouldn't. Uh, we don't have any reason to put a hyphen. We don't have a p prefix. I've been sort of trying to get Laurent to go along with a p prefix because it seems like there are a few cases where we would need it, but. We really don't have, he's right, we don't have good enough reason to at this point. Okay, um, this is when you have an R in syllables like that with a uh, acute coda and schwa vowel. Uh, this is another word which is universally re reconstructed as IJ. 
but again, the rhyming shows very clearly that it's schwa j. Uh, and this word also is very curious. This is a, uh, I mean, you could write a whole paper. In fact, I almost did write a whole paper about this one word, but this word also rhymes as if it's schwa j. Everybody puts it in ij. Um, Wang Li actually put it, treated it as if it were schwa j. But Dong Tung Ha came along and said he thought that was wrong. And then Wang Li said, OK, I'll go along with that. And every, ever since then, everybody uh, has treated it as if it's in the zhi bu instead of the wei bu, is what it amounts to in traditional terms. Look it up in Wang Li's dictionary, han yu da zi jian, han yu da zi jian. Don't care what it is, it's always going to be that way. But the curious thing is that everybody knows, or, or most people know, that it, the word is also written this way, which can only I mean, it, that is the, the phonetic in, in the way of Wei Bu, which is the name of the rhyme group that is reconstructed Shua J. Uh, and we find it written in similar ways in the excavated texts as well. In fact, this thing, uh, may, part of this may be the uh, Ban Zi, the original graph of Mei itself. Uh, then we've got uh, Pin instead of Fun and so forth. Okay, yeah. <coughs> well, uh, um, this is used as a phonetic, but I it's, oh, there I did it again. Uh, probably, I can't think of an example, but it's used as a phonetic, but I don't think the Shuo one says that this has a phonetic element in it. But the Shuo one does give this, I believe it's this, uh, if not this, a similar thing, as a gu wen form of the word. So it's right there in the Shuo one. Oh, no, it's, it's uh, you know, uh, one of the processes that applies to a writing system is that if you have two graphic elements that are similar in shape, there will be a tendency to write them the same way, even if the sound has nothing to do with it, if the two sounds have nothing to do with each other. Uh, so that, I think, is what you've got here. Uh, well, just a couple of things. These are kind of nice. Uh, we think in this case, uh, actually, the vowel rounded and uh, the R disappeared, so the R had no effect on the following vowel here. But uh, anyway, the, the, there are definitely L initial words in, uh, in uh, this phonetic series. And so it looks like, and now on the other hand, it seems to rhyme as schwa m, so it looks like prum is the best uh, reconstruction for wind. Uh, lin uh, w comes out as rum or something. And then we've got another word, uh, srum, which both of them refer to trees. This is supposed to be forest. This is supposed to be dense trees or something. Uh, they, it seems clear that they're somehow from the same uh, root. Don't know why. This is an interesting one because the phonetic is li. And the phonetic clearly indicates the r. <coughs> and, uh, and this also is supposed to have, I mean, there's this uh, Tibetan cognate of krup. Or something like that for to weep a krup krup for a crybaby or something like that. Maybe it's a loan from Chinese. I don't know. Okay. Uh, well, I think I'm running out of time. Is it time to quit? Um, I can show you the. This is the. I, I, at this point, I started to say skip it. Okay. There's a lot of cool stuff here. And then that's what I wrote it very early this morning. Because I see the next last character right yes. that I haven't seen before that, which seems to incorporate the phonetic mm, part of a Khan. Or yes. Uh -huh. But in Khan, you had put this L, which apparently. Well, the L is simply a mistake. Yes, but here you have this R. Yeah, well, there is an R here because it's division two. But the L has no reflex anyway. Uh, I really don't remember why. Why I, I think it was probably me that put the L there. I have no, I don't no memory of why it should be there. Uh, there was a period. I mean, one of the possibilities, of course, that that is worth entertaining is that there, that there wasn't just an R, but there could have been both R and L, and uh, maybe in some cases they uh, had the same reflexes, but. And it may well happen that when we get to a more specific knowledge of dialects, that we can begin to talk about these things uh, sensibly. But uh, I think 
um, for the time being, having uh, sort of fairly strict rules about what is and is not permissible in the reconstruction is the, is the best thing to do. I mean, if you have reason to, to change it, then you can change it. But uh, uh, there are many ways to take the thing in different directions, but um, uh, it's important to have some constraints. So that's why we don't, uh, well, and this is, again, I think what I uh, have learned from Laurent. In, in my book, I would say, well, maybe that's a prefix on that ice word, you know, or maybe there's an L in there, and I put it in there. And so the, the uh, well, it, I, that could be true, but, but uh, oh, le voila qui arrive. <laughs> Okay, so I was just uh, telling about how I learned everything I know from you. Uh, <laughs> but uh, so we're part of the strategy is to have a have clear rules about what you know for the time being about what is permissible and what is not. In other words, a theory of root and uh, roots and affixes, and uh, also of phonotactics. Um, and uh, sort of hold on to them for dear life unless some facts uh, require us to revise them, in which case we'll know why we're revising them. And it won't just be sort of a random walk from one uh, sort of vague system to another. But you can see here, I mean, we have this word pit. Uh, and here's fall into a pit with the same phonetic. This is probably from the same root somehow. Um, but we've got an R infix. I don't know if that means that you, a bunch of people fall into a pit together, <laughs> or you fall into more than one pit at the same time, or what? Or you keep falling into a pit, but, but in any case, there's an R there that's not there in the other form. And uh, it certainly looks like it ought to be uh, similar. It ought to be from the same root. closest thing to an utterance that you've ever made. So. <laughs> <laughs> yes, same. Some point you said, um, there's nothing I would expect from an R to do. Oh. I don't remember the word, but it was oh, well, something about both. Yeah, the, um, the fact is that, um, generally speaking, the effect of the R is we, I mean, the middle Chinese reflexes of R, or the result of the consequences of having an R, uh, is usually that we have a front vowel. Uh, and if there was a contrast of back versus uh, front, uh, that contrast is generally lost after R. Now, I don't think of R as the kind of thing that would necessarily do that. I don't really know of any particularly good parallels. Uh, if you can think of something better, by all means let us know, but there is a fair amount of evidence for, well, you, you could, the case for R against L is not all that strong, but we do have the early forms, for example, early loans in uh, Vietnamese, where the dragon has an initial R, if I'm not mistaken. Wrong. And so, uh, uh, after a certain period, the, uh, you have initial L's, but uh, at some point, uh, it was proposed to take an R from that. And it also so happens that uh, in Tibeto-Burman comparisons with Chinese, it's usually a Tibeto-Burman R that, that uh, matches the Chinese R, and an L that matches the Chinese L. Now that in itself is not a, a, a strong argument because uh, there can be a correspondence even if it, it doesn't have to be phonetic identity. But, uh, well, anyway, I, I'm just sort of rambling on. I don't know why the R does that, and I don't know. Uh, but that's the way we write it. Mm -hmm. Any ideas? Why does R have balance? 
John John discusses it in his uh, in his book, and he cites um, the South Chinese dialects where R is is uh, represented as a front dialect. Uh, so maybe there was some kind of intermediate stage. Of that. Yeah. Yeah. Of course. I mean, you have to realize that we're often we're looking at the beginning and end point of a long process when we're doing this. So we don't, it, it may be that the, that the process doesn't look very uh, plausible if you just look at the beginning and the end, but uh, they're perfectly plausible intermediate steps that would take you there. So I'm not worried too much about it, uh, but uh, it, I'm just confessing that I don't know why it would have that effect. Maybe it was, yeah, maybe it was uh, uh, some kind of a front arm. can talk about more examples if you want, but uh, I really uh, do encourage you to uh, interrupt with questions whenever, I mean, that, that's the only way I get feedback as to what people uh, want to know or need to know, or don't understand or object to, whatever. Okay, well, I think I got about to hear one you know, I guess uh, in general, uh, if you're doing a reconstruction, there's there are big things and there are little things. I mean, there are some there's some sweeping phonetic changes that uh, or sound changes and things that affect a large proportion of the vocabulary, and there are also small changes that may only affect a, a few a small proportion of the vocabulary. But if you're really going to do the history, the small ones are important too, and they're often crucial in clarifying the big ones. So it would it was a uh, uh, I think it was a, a, a good thing that we discovered or noticed that in unlike most situations uh, in type A syllables, when the main vowel is O uh, in at least in some of these cases. When the main vowel is O, say, in something like this, and also sometimes in, in type B, before a rounded vowel, R will sometimes just disappear entirely without a trace. So you, even if we don't, that's one of the reasons we put it in parentheses, even if we have no positive as evidence for it. And sometimes it uh, appears to make some sense. Let me make some notes here. Um, <coughs> So, well, of course, the R is, it is a, we believe it's an infix, and so it, oh, but in some cases it could be part of the root. So let, but let's take this uh, word, bang, for uh, country. And I don't have the phonetic characters on this, in this program. Uh, so that's what we have, basically. But, uh, and let's look at uh, fung is, uh, sorry. Okay, now this, this word has no indication that there's an R there, but by our current principles, we write it this way because this is one of the environments before ONG in type B that we uh, cannot tell whether there was an R there or not. But this is, looks like it, these, well, at, at this point we have no morphological process that would connect these, but they look like related roots, okay, at least. Uh, because uh, fung means to uh, enfeef, to give somebody, you know, a bunch of land. Uh, and uh, bang is a country. Okay, so uh, it's not implausible that these forms should be related. And if they're related, then the R could be part of the root in both cases. Another pair like that, which I'm fond of, but uh, again, we don't really have any process to relate them, is jia. This is uh, uh, home, I guess. And uh, ju, we've mentioned this, but 
So here is another case, probably also because of by the time, by the relevant time, the the vowel was already rounded, uh, that we can't tell whether there was an R there or not. And this means to well, there's also a question, uh, sort of a related question of this form. Um, I'm not sure what we have in there for that now, but uh, maybe no longer. TQH. TQH. And I'll use a, a question mark for the bottle stop, okay? Um, so a couple of things are going on here. First of all, we often find in, uh, in texts uh, that we'll have different versions of the text, and one of them will have G and the other one will have CHU. So to some degree, these were synonymous terms. They both have the same main vowel, uh, at least. And uh, this one has a weird, uh, well, I don't know. I, I think this treatment sort of implies that the uh, Tiger here is phonetic. Um, so, well, uh, uh, that's that's probably. But are we saying tiger is usual now or not? Just HR? We don't know. I don't know. Yeah, still HR. Well, in any case, um, so one problem is: is this word related? Are these two words related? Right? Is chu related to jia? Is Jia the place where you Ju? Right? And uh, this is related to the question of semantics, the lexical semantics. What is the difference between these two forms, both of which are usually uh, translated as something like to reside or to be in a place? Um, I think that Ju implies sort of a longer term being there than Chu. <laughs> Um, and chu is uh, not as permanent. Chu also sometimes means uh, to sit or maybe to rest. And so uh, I think it, so if this is a sort of longer term dwelling than, than chu, then it would not be surprising that it would be related to the word for uh, home. Um, but anyway, my point is that uh, this, if we, were, if we were reconstructing R's only where we had, I mean, if we were recognizing the possibility of an R only where we had some uh, uh, positive need to reconstruct it, then we would not have one, anything here. We would just have Ka because we don't know of any other reason to believe it's there. But uh, the system implies that, that that is a possibility. And as I say, we don't have any positive reason to believe it's there. But sometimes you make, you know, it's possible to make these, these connections and there may be uh, something to it. Um, let's see, what else was that? Uh, let's see. Oh, Lord. Maybe we should look at these. A lot of common words here. Um, again, we have a, di a difference. Uh, well, as with type A, with the A vowel, we have a, di a difference depending on whether the open syllables are treated differently from closed syllables. Uh, and uh, there's a kind of interesting detail here that uh, if you if the initial is either rounded or uh, is either labial or labialized then you have a different reflex, this J-U reflex, than if, the, if it is not. And this is, in fact, one of the ways you can detect whether the, whether the initial is uh, labialized or not, because in type A, you can't tell if both of them will come out as K-U. But in, uh, uh, now, this actually also, by the way, is a case 
where a study was done by uh, Luo Changpei, a very fine 20th century linguist, uh, establishing on the basis of, uh, of, uh, of uh, rhymes in poetry uh, where the J-U and J-O were distinguished. And uh, let me just uh, point this out. There's uh, several things going on here. Let's look at a few things. U. Uh, these are two rhymes in the in the Che Yun, uh, in the Ping Shan. This is the Ping Shan rhymes. Uh, they are right next to each other, and they both begin with the same initial consonant. And this is one of the kind of this part of the structure of the book, or the organization of the book. It is significant, I'm sure, that these are put together. It was at least realized that they were similar in sound, but probably it means that there were dialects which did not distinguish them. Um, and uh, Luo Changpei did a study, and uh, well, first of all, there are very few, there are a few, but not that many cases where modern dialects do make this distinction. Um, and uh, it's in the, I think it's in the same place, I'm doing this from memory, but I think it's in the same general region as Luo Changpei found the distinction in poetry. So what he, what he did was he went back and looked at, I don't know which, probably, poetry of more or less the early Chinese period and, and uh, tried to see whether the uh, poets uh, mixed these two rhymes uh, you know, interchangeably or whether they distinguished them. And uh, this is the kind of thing, well, it's the same sort of thing as the problem in my book about whether the Yan group should be subdivided or not. And he found an area where people did uh, distinguish them, and it, it, I believe it was right in the Yor, lower Yangtze uh, Valley. Uh, and in fact, that in some of the Wu dialects in that area is where you still find different reflexes. What's the second one mean? Uh, well, uh, fortunately, I have my uh, nice online dictionary. Uh, <laughs> it means, according to this, it means prediction, anxiety, deceive. I don't know what the diff connection is between prediction and anxiety. Uh, well, I, I, we could look and see what Cogren says at least. No relationship to Hmm. No relationship with fish. Oh, no. No re relationship with fish. Yeah, fish with fish. Oh, no, that's not right. <coughs> oh, A sacrifice on the day of burial. <laughs> yeah, that's one anyway. Chat. To plot against. Estimate, calculate, think seriously about, consider, and so forth. These are Crawford's definitions. Gamester, forester. All right, that's it. Um, well, you see what we're up against. But probably uh, some. I mean, one of the things which we. Uh, recognize that we need to do and haven't really uh, uh, managed uh, to do yet is to go back and check which of these glosses really are to be taken seriously and which of them are, are hapax legomena that just occur in one text and somebody says it ought to be uh, interpreted as such and such a thing. Uh, and uh, uh, because some of them are just lone characters and we don't know, you know, we don't even know if it's correct to consider them lone characters for such and such a thing. But, uh, yeah, so in fact, I, I, all I can say is I really don't know what <laughs> this other thing is as close as I can, I, I can get. Notice, the, by the way, that we came across in looking at them, we came across these other things like, uh, well, this word which means ignorant or stupid is uh, from that. So this is a so-called, uh, both of these are yu hu. 
and this one is hou fu. Okay, so yu fu is ah, and hou fu is is uh, all. And so if there's, you know, it makes some sense, if there's a, a rounded initial, it has more or less the same effect as if the vowel were rounded and those two merge. But, again, as I say, there was only a minority of uh, Middle Chinese dialects which made this distinction at all. So that's one of the reasons, again, why we don't want to treat this as a, as a reconstruction, because uh, you know, the vowel system that's implied by one part of the system might be quite different from the system implied by some other set of data just because they made different decisions about which dialects to represent, which dialect distinctions to represent. But this is something to notice about the, uh, did I we put up the, oh, uh, did we put up the, uh, the uh, uh, Che Yun manuscript? Anybody, has anybody looked at the site? Okay. Uh, well, this is kind of, kind of cool. Um, I, I'm just sort of ad-libbing here. I, it, it, uh, if you have a, a um, specific question, please interrupt me. But I can show you this, uh, which we will put up on. Yes, I know that. Okay. Uh, all right, so this is a, a, well, this is this manuscript that was found in 1947 in the uh, Foreign Palace Museum in Beijing. I don't know why it's over to the side. Um, but I wanted to show you, well, let's take a uh, closer look here. at the uh, way the rhymes are treated. We must not be ready, must not, must not like this display size. Well, I, I'll just have to describe it. Um, um, we have a lot of cases like this where adjacent rhymes in the, uh, in the Che Yun uh, have the same initial consonant, and they're obviously similar, at least phonetically. And so those are probably cases where, uh, I mean, we know that in the process of writing this dictionary, what they did is they took, there already existed dictionaries, which were probably uh, done in different places, and which, uh, where they had disagreement, some people might disagree with them, and so basically they took all of the distinctions that had been made in any of these uh, previous rhyme dictionaries, and they included them all. So if any of the dictionaries made the distinction, they, they included the distinction. Uh, but again, that's why we have these, uh, probably why we have these adjacent rhymes that are that have the same initial consonant. That's a kind of a mark. That if you want to, or if this is appropriate to your dialect, you know, this is it would make sense for these to be together. Uh, if not, then you can see that. Let's go back to this. All right, so uh, then other, yeah, well, uh, remember, uh, well, I don't know if it's a case of remember or not, but there are a few cases where we have the unexpected reflex for what otherwise looks like it should be a uh, consonant A. We have instead of CJO, we have CJAE. It only happens in a certain, there's probably some phonological context that's involved, it only happens with certain kinds of words. Uh, and the same thing happens with a K. C, C A K would normally give C J A K, but in a certain number of words it gives C uh, J E K. Uh, and we think it's probably so. One thing involved is dialect, probably. But let's just look here. So the word uh, to not have, Wu, uh, is in this group, and. Uh, we can't tell, it probably doesn't have an R. I would think that this would be a fairly simple word that would, you know, almost a sort of function word, so you can expect it to have a reduced uh, 
phonological uh, structure, but we put it in anyway. And since it's a labial, it goes to MJU. Uh, this is the, you will notice if you, if this is not, not already clear to you, that many of the M's of Middle Chinese have changed to W in, in Mandarin, and many of the P's and D's have changed to F. Uh, that's a process that happened after late, after early Middle Chinese. It happened, it shows up in late Middle Chinese, but not in the rhyme books. Uh, and you will sometimes hear people talk about the, uh, the lady, the, labiodental initial, initials of the Che Yun, and it's nonsense because they, uh, that's just a sign that you should uh, hold on to your wallet and walk the other way because the person doesn't know what they're <laughs> talking about. Um, all right, uh, here's a little tidbit. Um, so here's the Wu. I'm doing it in the opposite order here. Uh, there's another word written this way. Uh, now these are generally treated as homonyms, but this one means don't. Okay. Um, and one of the things that one of the little sort of footnotes in my book is uh, I think these originally had different main vowels. Uh, so actually, this is. Uh, Because this uh, phonetic uh, sometimes stands for an O, right? as in Chindam, for example, uh, which is, uh, well, the two characters are used interchangeably in early texts. So this is Mu uh, uh, from, I believe it's usually written this way, but it's probably, yeah. So this could be this. I think that's right. And there are other words with this as phonetic, which uh, imply that they're in hōbu. Again, it's a, it's a question of hōbu versus yūbu. This is, so I claim this is hōbu and this is yūbu. Now, it's perfectly true if you look at the received texts uh, of the Chinese tradition, that you will often find this word used to mean don't, and this word used to mean, maybe not less often, this word used to mean not have, but, but uh, they often are, are used for one another in the received versions of the classics. And I think that simply reflects the fact that uh, by that time, in that dialect, these words had already emerged uh, phonetically. Originally, there was a distinction in vowel. Ma meant, uh, I probably know R, right? Ma meant have not, and mo meant don't. Uh, and they were written differently, and I think they are not, the, the farther back in time you go, the less likely you are to find these, these in, in text, actual text that can be dated, uh, manuscripts or ex excavated texts that can be dated, the farther back you go in time, the more these, the, the less likely these are to be confused. I think that, I, I haven't done a thorough search on this, but I'm, that would be the prediction. And then, sometime in the Han Dynasty, which is, as, you, as I mentioned, the default time for any change to occur, if you don't know when it happened, is uh, uh, these two came to merge phonologically, and at that point, people, uh, as far as they were concerned, the word for not have was mo, and the word for, for don't was mo, and so they had no reason to choose one character rather than the other. There's going to be a paper on the, in, at the end. The ACI conference at Leipzig this year on this topic. I just know because I had to read the, uh, the abstract. So, um. Do you uh, know what will be said? Or? <laughs> no, I don't remember exactly. Yeah. So, but um, if you're interested, so you can yes. check the website. Yeah, 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 that's nice. Uh, uh, well, anyway, this is in my book. I, I, I propose yeah. this. And, uh, Sorry? Well, I think in the case of negatives, we have, you know, we have a set of forms that begin with M and another set of forms that begin with P. I don't think at this point you can assign uh, the same, you know, I don't think you can identify a root. All you can say is that there are M initial negatives and there are P initial negatives. I don't, I wouldn't want to try to identify the root. But if, well, the root would have to be M. I mean, <laughs> So, uh, 
I don't th I think, well, I don't know what the early history of it is, but by the time we get to Old Chinese, uh, we don't know of any process that would connect these two in terms of the synchronic morphology of the time. It's no, just, even in the oracle inscriptions, yeah. the inscriptions, they are kept separate. So, and, uh, yeah, and, and it's really not until the, uh, well, as I say, the all-purpose Han dynasty that you, or probably before that, that you uh, you get uh, them interchange. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's not as if it's not as if they represent the same root. But but when you're dealing with these empty particles or these grammatical particles like this, uh, of course you have patterns of like quid and, and quis and so forth. Uh, I mean, it's qua the morphine by all by itself, uh, or qua in English where and what and when. Is that a question out of curiosity? Um, yeah. Well, that's the only good reason, right? <laughs> it's just that it's not weird. But it's something that I have always wondered about. It's about mm and mo in Cantonese. What is the relationship of these two? Uh, I don't have a there is any. terribly good story to tell about that, except that um, Well, mm, I mean, I know what mm is like who, and uh, mo is like uh, male. Male. So that much is, is clear. Um, there are many dialects where the regular development of Middle Chinese MJU would be to a syllabic nasal. Okay. Uh, but I don't. I don't think we can speak, I mean, we don't really have a terribly good, at least I don't have a terribly good story to tell about about those uh, particular forms. Uh, and uh, it appears that Cantonese has has lost the P negatives and has only an M negative. Or maybe there's, maybe the M was there all along and just wasn't recorded in the rhyme books because it wasn't easy to figure out what the rhyme was, or no way to write it. Well, what we yeah, the pragmatic um, distinction is, for example, in modern Mandarin, it's clearly in structure. So if you have who and mayo, and I think it must be some sort of the same thing for Cantonese, but it's just, of course, um, you have to figure out where it comes from. So I, and it's, yeah. well, that's I wanted to know, because I was surprised at first by the fact that it's certain now written down with implanted characters. With what? Implanted characters. I mean, special, specific yeah, characters which are. Yeah. Well, um, yeah. you know, this is what uh, Laurent was emphasizing be before. Uh, uh, the spoken dialects have vocabulary that's probably just never made it into the Roman books in the first place. And uh, uh, let's see. Well, in Southern Min, you have uh, Bo, which is sort of like. Uh, Mo, I think, and uh, and isn't the I mean, my memory is failing me. But the negative is like can't move. Right? Mm -hmm. How do you exactly. say not exactly? Exactly, exactly. 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 Yeah. So uh, so at least I mean that's uh, more or less a shared similar thing shared between men and Cantonese, and men and Cantonese are not especially closely related. So it's probably a retention rather it could be a retention rather than an innovation. So it could be rather old. Uh, yeah, or it even could be. I don't know. I don't know yet now how it's written. But there is another negative in classical Chinese, the way. You know this one. Um, oh no, 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 no. It's it's written like with uh, myself yeah. wu with the yeah, because, mouth radical. Oh yeah, so I see. Yeah. So uh, it's because this this can uh, better into or this can to a certain extent change with wu. So. look at the old database. Uh, yes, we have an interesting story to tell about Sua, and that is, uh, uh, I think we've begun to make sense of this. Uh, so here we have it, Skra, right? 
Uh, now, I don't rem Yeah, you notice it's often the case that Carl Grimlin is unable to figure out the phonetic uh, relationship between uh, words. So even if the quo one says such and such is phonetic and so and so, uh, if Carl Grimlin couldn't make it look plausible, he would not accept that and he would, he would put them in different series. And that's happened here. So uh, let's see, what's 53? So according to, I believe it says, according to the Shaw one, it says that who is phonetic, which is uh, what you, that's who over here. Okay. Um, and uh, then you have to decide what, whether this is velar or uvular. Um, well, anyway, let's see. Um, yeah, one of the interesting things about this is that we do find um, we have cases where uh, so and she uh, are uh, interchanged, right? And so uh, I don't, well, other people might have a way of dealing with this, but I think that our way is the best so far. Um, uh, I think that it's a matter of the uvulars. Uh, so now let's look at go back for a minute and look at and uh, Okay, uh, as far as Middle Chinese can tell us, these words are entirely homonyms. But uh, one of the things that one of our current uh, uh, principles is that, well, I guess uh, Laura mentioned it, must have mentioned it this morning with the two Yang phonetics, right? Uh, this, this kind of uh, Yang and uh, this kind of Yang. Uh, where you have phonetics which look like homonyms, but and, and where they're both are widely used as phonetics, but they have little contact with each other, they have little overlap between the words written, then you can probably assume that they became homonyms late, and that originally they were they were not homonyms. So uh, I mean, there are a few cases where words written with this can be also written with this and so forth. But for example, I don't think we ever find the first person pronoun written with this, uh, and uh, whereas it is written with this, uh, fish is never written with this, or fish is never used to write this, uh, and so forth. So we, just, we think that these, uh, this tipped us off that probably these were different uh, in Old Chinese. And since uh, the only other place we can get a velar nasal from, uh, aside from a velar nasal, is a uh, uh, uvular. Let me, see, let, me get, let me make sure I have the right form. Here. Yeah. Okay. So ka. Well, we have a large uh, sort of a lot of talk here, but uh, well, it didn't come out, it's an H. So that's what we think it is, okay? And uh, now, the former story, for example, Li Fang Gui uh, uh, already was reconstructing voiceless uh, resonance, and so uh, Li Fang Gui, for instance, for Wu, this uh, Wu would have uh, that, and so for Xu, uh, he had uh, that. Okay. And this, you could have expressed the same thing in our system. We would have a na 
and no J, of course, and we'd have a lot of stop and so forth, but that would be it. And we thought that for some time until, uh, well, Laurent came up with this idea of that the writing system was um, not just a matter of memorizing thousands of forms, but it, it was really based on a, a kind of a, uh, a set of, of phonetics for different uh, uh, syllable types. And uh, these probably are different types of syllables. And interestingly, I was going to mention this tomorrow, but um, let's see, uh, I was looking through, just sort of quickly scanning through, I don't remember now where the, oh, it's probably in the, uh, in the database, actually. You know this uh, phrase, woohoo, written that way or various ways. Uh, in an excavated text, uh, and I'm, a, I'm sorry I don't remember which, but I was looking through them on the Chant uh, website from uh, Hong Kong, and there is a text where this expression, the second syllable of this, is written with shi. Right, so there's no reason to reconstruct the nasal here. Okay. Now it could be that this indicates that the uh, uvular nasal, I mean, sorry, the, uh, that it really was a velar nasal, but it already changed to X or something like that. But what we think is going on is that this, I mean, the, the word is uh, hu, right? It's uh, hu from hu, and that has to be that for us, right? Well, it doesn't have to be, but if it's a uvular, that's what it would be. And so this is further evidence that the that xu for us uh, wu, this wu is just. Uh, that, because uh, then we get this same character used to write uh, the second syllable of wu -hu. So that's, and then somehow with uh, swa, we have, uh, let me make sure I have it right. Yes, and uh, who, which uh, Carlgren couldn't account for. This is actually from Shangsheng also, and this is must be. So this uh, Seshan connection, which uh, Calgren was not able to figure out, but which is reported in the Chuo Wen, uh, makes sense in terms of our current reconstruction. And it's tied to several other facts, like, uh, like the fact that, well, that uh, like the connection to Xu, uh, et cetera. Now, the other word was D. Uh, well, uh, I think that's uh, pretty straightforward, actually. I don't know of anything special about it. Uh, but, uh, well, some of these we haven't even structured, but here it is. Now, let's stop obstruct. You want the one that means low, I guess. I hope there's one that means oh, root, base. Some of these things are missing. Yeah. It's probably basically this, right? So actually, we haven't put this in yet, but it, it, I think it should be that. And uh, make sure that. 
Well, I, this is just a copy of the data. I, I, it's no point in updating it because this is just a static copy that we copied from the site. So I, it won't, doesn't make any sense to update this copy. But that's what that's what we think. Is going on. Any particular reason for those mm -hmm. thoughts about those particular words? Okay. <laughs> All right. Anybody else want to ask about their favorite word? About the old Chinese for mother. Yes. Formerly you had O, O, so you had an alternative there. Well, I think uh, the O is earlier. And the uh, schwa. Yeah, this is, I mean, uh, uh, again, I would like to know when and where this happened, but. It looks like there are all sorts of good reasons for reconstructing mother with, uh, uh, as this way. Actually, there could be an O, an R there as well, but probably not, right? Uh, but the trouble is, it rhymes as uh, schwa uh, a lot. Right. Most of the time, it rhymes in, in the text. We see it rhymes as schwa. Now, it's in my book. I don't remember. At least some words with this phonetic um, uh, do rhyme as o. I think in Zhuangzi or something. And uh, the, another parallel case is the word for uh, uh, you know the area of land, which is the same thing exactly. Oh, sorry, this should be two inches. Uh, and it so happens that uh, uh, we have uh, two mo words in Tibetan. This is not why we did it, but, but it does so happen that there are two, that, that there's a word for plow, to plow or something in, in uh, Tibetan that's M, I think it's R-E-M-O, is that it? Yeah, and there's also, mother is also mo, am I correct? Yeah. So uh, these are the vowels that, if that's a good correspondence, O to O, those are the vowels that would match to better vermin too. Uh, but since it rhymes so frequently as schwa, I think you have to assume that there was a dialect, and that this is not the only case, there are other cases as well, that you have to assume that he is going to use at for schwa, sorry, P-O became, uh, maybe it's P-P-O, I don't know, at least P-P-O became schwa and uh, rhymed that way. And that's why we have, uh, uh, well, that's how this can be phonetic in, I mean, can be basically the same character as the don't word. Uh, so forth. But I don't think the don't word was ma. I'm pretty sure it was mo. Okay. a question. I was just saying at the beginning, I'm wondering since you know, then, since all Chinese really now starts to look like um, more like Tibetan languages, more like translational languages. And at the same time, the reconstruct now is the precision of the prefix is subject to the same. Um, have you ever thought of possible correlation between verbal agreement and verbal languages? Because they all have very elaborated systems, and you know, in your system, there's only one perfected suffix, and that's all. And it would be strange not to have anything else which would be. Well, of course. Um, what, what, what is going on? Remember that we only have incomplete information. So uh, the fact that we can't reconstruct something doesn't mean that it didn't exist. Mm -hmm. And so the fact that what we can reconstruct it doesn't look like a natural system doesn't mean that it wasn't a natural system. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I'm not saying that this depends on unnatural reconstruction exactly, but, but in the case of a question like that, there could well be processes which have simply been lost entirely. Mm -hmm. Uh, but, we, well, in terms of verbal agreement, uh, I don't think we have any trace of that. I don't know of any trace of that uh, in 
China, in Old Chinese. Um, and the, uh, there are a few cases, as uh, Laurent pointed out, where the S uh, seems to have something in common with the perfected meaning. But uh, actually, the novel that many of those is usually one of the others. Uh, at least I don't think of that. Uh, so, and, and uh, I'm flattered to hear you talk about precision, but I mean, the, the, we are certainly in the early stages of figuring out the prefix system. It's, it's uh, a very complicated story, and some parts of it, I think, are. Well, the, the part about the. The part we like the best, I think you can see if you disagree or not, but the part we like the best is the parts that we can confirm by uh, connecting them with either min or with uh, loan words in Yao Yao. Uh, to the extent that we can tell a, a consistent story that connects the old Chinese information with min, with uh, uh, Miao Yao, Hmong Yan. Uh, that's the kind of thing where you have converging kinds of evidence. That's uh, that's when you are, can be more or less confident that you're probably on the right track. Uh, now, if if you limit yourself to things that you have already had that confirmation on, you won't ever find them. I mean, you have to have to come up with an idea about how they're related and then check it just as there's no way to sort of just empirically from the rhymes there's probably it's probably pretty hard to separate out uh, a n e n o n if you don't have any prediction as to which should be which mm -hmm. but uh, once you have a hypothesis that, that you can check then you can make progress and either it's it's uh, supported by the data and you sort of hang on to it or else it looks like you're going up a blind alley. Uh, so it, the the, suffix, the prefix business is very much, and the different prefixes are in different stages like that. Uh, I think we we like the M prefix, uh, certainly the volitional action thing. The, I mean, most of the M's that, that Lono talked about, I think, are, are seem pretty solid. The capital N seems pretty solid. S, uh, at least one of this function of applicative seems to be nice. Um, actually, yeah, what is the S in SWA, do you think? Is um, that the, the term? I mean, depending on what the root means, but if the root means the reserve being located, I could say it's not being located. Yeah, so it's that, uh, it's that, uh, yeah, or the circumstance, what do you think? Circumstantial, place of, place of, place of the time or function. Uh, I was going to say, uh, when we're talking about Ju and Chu, uh, this, there's a lot that needs to be figured out about these forms. Uh, Chu, for example, is, uh, uh, well, as we reconstructed it, it, it's connected to the, I mean, uh, as we now reconstruct it, it's connected to Swa. Uh, we've got Q, Q, H, A, uh, throttle stop. Uh, that would be more or less the root. And sometimes you got an R, sometimes you don't. Sometimes you got a prefix, sometimes you don't. Um, but uh, we also need to make sure that, well, it would be nice to know what, more precisely what the semantics of Chu and Chu are. Uh, because, uh, as I say, in, in some cases they seem to be used interchangeably, but I don't, they're not always interchangeably. I, I don't think their forms are the same group. I think they're two different groups. Five o'clock. Well, so if there are no more questions, we'll see you tomorrow.